Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Manure Management and Water Quality, On-Farm Research Results. My name is Julia Freuk. I am the Project Coordinator here at the Partnership for Ag Resource Management, and will be hosting the webinar this morning. We are joined today by my colleague, Caitlin Leahy, Project Manager for PARM, who will provide a brief introduction. I'm also pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Amber Radatz, Co-Director of UW Discovery Farms. Before we begin, I will go over some brief logistics. Please remember to submit questions for Amber on the GoToWebinar panel during her presentation. I will moderate the questions for approximately 10 minutes after the presentation. You will receive an email in the next few days with the webinar recording and link to the webinar evaluation. The recording will also be available on partnershipfarm.org and YouTube. By attending today's webinar, you are eligible for 1.5 CCA continuing education units, one for soil and water management, and 0.5 for nutrient management. You must be present for the entire webinar to receive those points. If you submitted your CCA number at registration and are watching the webinar live, no further action is required to submit your CEUs. If you are watching this on demand at a later date, please be sure to watch the entire presentation through the GoToWebinar platform and not YouTube to receive credit. If you watch the recording more than two weeks after the original broadcast, please email your CCA number to julia at partnershipfarm.org to ensure your credits are submitted. Please make a big note that credits often take a few weeks to appear in your account. If it has been more than four weeks, please contact my email. And now, with the logistics taken care of, I will turn it over to Caitlin. Thanks, Julia, and thanks everyone for joining us today. The Partnership for Ag Resource Management, or PARM as we call ourselves, is an effort of the IPM Institute of North America, a nonprofit organization made up of several projects in agriculture and community IPM that focus on using the power of the marketplace to improve outcomes in health, environment, and economics, all key elements of sustainability. According to NOAA, 2019 has been a record wet year for several regions in the US based on data going back to 1895. This increased rainfall has substantial impacts on our water quality and profits for farmers and agricultural retailers. Increased algal bloom growth resulting from nutrient runoff has been occurring in several areas around the nation, most advertised in the Western Lake Erie Basin, where the Palm, Palm Projects initially started. Many of you can remember in 2014, the water supply was shut off to over 400,000 residents in and surrounding Toledo, Ohio, from the toxicity level of the blue-green algae. You can see by the graph on the bottom that these blooms are on average becoming more frequent and severe. This is something so many of us are even observing in our own backyards. But as mentioned, this also affects profitability as vital fertilizer is lost with surface runoff and leaching instead of used for crop uptake. This is where our project comes into play. PARM addresses water quality issues by working with ag retailers to promote track and report on profitable products and services that keep inputs on cropland. Through retail sales, or in other words, customer adoption of practices like cover crops and variable rate technology, we can estimate nutrient loss reductions based on peer-reviewed studies. These estimates are variable due to factors like slope, soil type, and weather, but give our participants the best idea of where they can likely make a difference. We track these sales through annual surveys and provide both aggregate public reports and confidential individual nutrient stewardship reports for participants. The 90 plus ag retail locations we partner with in the Great Lakes and Upper Mississippi River basins are working hard to improve water quality. Our survey results show average increases in several products and services, including soil sampling and cover crops. Our participants represent over 5.3 million acres in both basins, giving us ample data on current adoption rates, retail profitability of products and services, and barriers to adoption. By analyzing our survey results, we can offer catered educational tools to retail locations that help staff convey the benefits of nutrient management practices to customers. 
We also offer watershed and statewide incentive programs that allow customers to try new practices like cover crops and variable rate without requiring extensive paperwork. You can receive these benefits and many others by becoming a valued PARM member. Visit our website or contact me at Caitlin at partnershipfarm.org. With that, I'll turn it back to Julia. Thank you, Caitlin. As Caitlin mentioned, we provide free resources for egg retailers, grower clients, and consultants. On the left is our continually updated and for our approved agronomist handbook, available free for download. We develop these locally and regionally for individual locations. Our phosphorus loss reduction wall cards in the lower left corner can also be ordered for free on our website. To find out more about our incentive programs, click the menu under our egg retailer tab on the PARM website. Our next webinar in the Great Lakes Conservation Connect series will air December 18th and will feature Rob Myers, Regional Coordinator for Sustainable Agriculture Research, Agriculture Research and Education and Program Director for the Agricultural Engineering Department at the University of Missouri Extension. He will discuss cover crop economics based on five years of data from national surveys. Our next webinar in our regular PARM series will air in January, topic and date to be determined. Look for announcements in your email, on Facebook, and Twitter. And remember, we take in cons into consideration your suggestions for webinar topics, so be sure to fill out our evaluation form after the webinar. Today's webinar is sponsored by Purdue University's Center for Food and Agricultural Business. We will now hear from Betty Jones Bliss, Associate Director for Purdue's Center for Food and Agricultural Business. Okay, Betty, that looks good. You can go ahead. Oh, yep, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you, Julia, and good morning and greetings from Purdue University. I'm really pleased to announce that the ARA Management Academy is in its 14th year and will be conducted in at the end of January 2020. We've been working in partnership with the Ag Retail Association for the past 15 years, and Currently, we are also partnering with Arizona State University, so our academy will be, will be held in Tempe, Arizona in, in January. So why the a ARA Management Academy? Why has it been successful in drawing ag retailers and suppliers from across the country each year? Well, I think we'd all agree that change continues to be our one constant. Our competitive landscape continues to shift, to move at a pretty amazing speed, especially in this time of a, a real focus on, dig, on, on digital agriculture. It's to be successful in this environment, it's really crucial that managers continue to hone their business acumen and leadership skills. It's really necessary to meet the upcoming challenges that we see ahead. So who attends our academy every year? Well, we have ag retailers and suppliers from across the country. Uh, some of those participants are, have taken on increased responsibilities. But the academy is also a great place to be if you need to revisit best management practices, if you need a refresher, if you need to update management processes and the way you approach your business. So what if you decide to attend the academy? What could you expect? Well, here's just a, a brief overview. In the academy, over the three days, we're going to think about what it means to be strategic versus operational. Those operational decisions are really important, but there's an expectation now to meet marketplace challenges that you've also got to think strategically. We will take some time during the, during the academy to think about the future, the next five years, the next 10 years. What is, what is coming at us very quickly in terms of innovation and disruption? We'll look at how organizations measure profit, profit, profitability, and then we'll discuss how do your responsibilities affect the bottom line in the company? We'll practice ideas and tools 
for leading employees, if you don't manage an employee, we'll look at how you can influence across the team and across the organization. We're going to learn how to identify goals of your key customers. What do your customers need? What are their goals for the future? And how can you work together, create value together as a team? We're also going to practice a process called service blueprinting. It allows you to map processes in your organization and then identify gaps and places that you can reduce inefficiencies. Ultimately, the, the goal is to really um, upgrade to a superior customer service. The Academy is three days, January 28th, 29th, and 30th, as I mentioned, in Tempe, Arizona. You can expect classroom discussion, small group conversations, uh, a lot of engaging activities and very practical exercises. We always think in our, in our workshops that one of the greatest values is the networking opportunities that you have across a, a diverse group of, of professionals. So if you or someone in your organization wants to take the opportunity in January to, to get away for a couple of days, uh, move away from the, the, the day to day and take time to think about your roles and responsibilities. The Academy is a place for you to, to think about the future and leave with a developed list of action steps. Things that you can go back to your business and apply. There's seven CCA credits uh, available for attending the Academy. I'm very pleased to uh, talk with anybody about questions or provide additional information. I put my email address and phone number. So I thank you for the time to talk with you again about our 14th ARA Management Academy. I hope that someone that's listening, I, I may meet you in, in January at uh, Arizona State University. So thank you, Julia, for the opportunity this morning. All right. Thank you, Betty, and to all of Purdue University's Center for Food and Agricultural Business for being our sponsor today. And now we're going to get the presentation started with Amber Radatz, co-director of UW Discovery Farms. All right, it looks good, Amber, go ahead. Okay, great, thanks, Julia. Well, hello, um, my name is Amber Raditz. I'm one of the co-directors of the Discovery Farms program here in Wisconsin. Um, in Wisconsin, we are part of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension. Um, Discovery Farms is a branded program within Extension, so we work statewide and um, we work with um, farmers all around Wisconsin. Uh, and other states as well. So the first question that people often ask is, um, oh, so where is where is the Discovery Farm? And where where is the farm? Well, the answer to that is really that um, the the farm is farms all over Wisconsin. The Discovery Farms program started in Wisconsin in 2001 and has since grown to a couple of other states. And so there are really Discovery Farms in states like Minnesota, Arkansas, and Washington. Um, what Discovery Farms are, are privately owned farms that uh, agree or volunteer to have water quality monitoring done on their farm for a period of usually five to seven years as our window. Um, the program is based on three pillars, which is farmer engagement and leadership, credible water quality research, and then communicating those results back. In Wisconsin, we are through Extension, as I mentioned. Um, in Arkansas, it's through the University of Arkansas. Um, in Minnesota, it is through the Minnesota Agricultural Water Resources Center. And in Washington, uh, it's run by Dr. Nicole Embertson and um, partnered through conservation districts there. So there are a few different models, but everybody operates under the same principles. Um, and I'll go through those principles a little bit more now. So when we talk about being a farmer-led and farmer-engaged 
um, program, we use farmer leadership in a few ways. So first, what you can see on the top left hand corner there is a farmer on his farm talking about the things that um, are important to him and his farm and the things that he's learned through participating. His name is Joe Bragger. He was the first Wisconsin Discovery Farm. He actually worked with the first um, director of Discovery Farms to develop the program in response to the idea that um, policy was being proposed that would put a large part of his farm out of business. And um, in terms of having it to not be in anything but perennial, um, perennial crops. And so because of it, closeness to the stream and slope and things like that. And so at that time in Wisconsin, the idea was born that doing research on working farms to understand the unique landscape and farming system characteristics would be the best way to infuse more science into those policy recommendations. And so Joe worked to be the first discovery farm and um, continued to host tours on his farm. He still does that today. And to talk about what he learned through participation in the Discovery Farms program that allowed him to not only adapt his practices on his farm, but also to um, allow him to engage in these conversations at a state and national level as in regards to water quality. So the picture on the bottom left there is a picture of our steering committee. And what, a steering, what our steering committee functions as, as the way to um, bring concerns from agricultural and environmental groups in the state, um, bring concerns to us that could possibly use uh, a project, a monitoring project like this to help inform the question. And then also um, give us feedback on the ideas that we have for research. And then once we do have information to communicate, they help us in communicating that information by um, utilizing their groups as communication methods to get the word out even further. So for us, farmer leadership is an important core tenet of the program and something that helps us to just do our job more effectively and be really grounded in the type of work that we do. The map there of Wisconsin, the dark blue is the areas that we currently have monitoring and the light blue is places that we have worked in previously. So still a lot of counties left in the state to get to, um, but we're trying to make our projects more accessible and um, increase the amount of people that can participate in gathering their own on-farm research data around the state. So what does on-farm research water quality look like for us? Well, so for us, what we're monitoring on these privately owned farms are weather. So a whole bunch of weather parameters like uh, precipitation, temperature, soil temperature, soil moisture, wind speed, radiation, all of those things that can help inform when we get water quality results back. What was the weather doing at that time? Um, and weather and soil, what were they doing at that time? And then from our stations, what we're collecting is um, runoff. This is a picture of a surface water monitoring station. We also have tile monitoring and have done some stream monitoring. I'm gonna mostly talk about surface runoff today. Um, that station is operated in partnership with the US Geological Survey in Wisconsin. And what we collect from there is the amount of runoff and also um, analyze our samples then for sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus. We do a couple of different types of phosphorus so that we can talk about dissolved and particulate phosphorus. And then we have um, organic nitrogen and um, ammonia and so that we're able to talk about different pieces of that in different scenarios as well. So really what we try to do is to connect to what we're collecting from the water analysis from what the station tells us about when runoff occurred and how much runoff occurred, connect that to the water and soil characteristics at that time. And then the layer that I don't have listed on here is the agronomic layer, which is where we work with the farmers to understand what field operations occurred in that field at what time so that we can kind of relate all of those pieces together. What we're able to do with this system is to be monitoring continuously for um, 365, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and we're able to really characterize storms from beginning to end, as well as um, be able to come up with a pounds per acre measurement or a concentration measurement, 
which are useful in different scenarios as well. And I'll show some of that. In terms of um, extending the message, that becomes really critical for us to show, um, to be able to help, help other farmers to use this information and to help, in, to help inform policy and other educational um, efforts in the state. So we do, our staff does a lot of presentations, we host events, we write materials and distribute them. Um, and are always trying to find new ways to connect with people, reach a new audience, to make sure that this information is as widely used as possible. So the users of our information, definitely farmers, is sort of our first um, first client group that we focus in on. But then um, crop consultants has become a really important audience for us because um, of the work with so many farmers across the state, and then also agency policymakers, other educational, um, other educational opportunities, things like that. So we have kind of a variety of audiences and an audience that is continually really interested is um, the kind of general public audience. So really trying to balance all of those, all of those audiences and um, hear the feedback from each one. So shameless plug, the, um, I'll give you this right away, the opp an opportunity to come hear more about Discovery Farms research than what you'll hear today is at our Discovery Farms Summit, which is going to be January 7th and 8th in um, Bloomington, Minnesota. And what it will be is a couple of days of really understanding a lot more about, especially the Wisconsin and Minnesota Discovery Farms programs. We're hosting this event. and. Um, there will be some Arkansas folks there as well, but we um, just want to really share what we have so you'll be able to hear from researchers that have used our data, um, policy folks that have used our data, farmers and um, participants, ag groups, funders, just a whole, um, a whole bunch of people that have interacted. And so what we're looking for is to be able to help attendees come away with really practical solutions that have been developed from this research and then think about new opportunities for using this type of work. So the way that I view my job is to really provide science to support continuous improvement and tools that help farmers address water quality issues. And what I tell farmers is that it's your job to really decide how to adopt and adapt these tools to your own farm and your own unique situation. What you won't hear from me today is that there's one way to, um, to address water quality when it comes to manure or any other farming system. There's definitely a very subtle balance that we need to strike for that. One of the things we've started to talk about in Wisconsin is that as we move forward in agriculture, one of deciding which of these tools to really adapt for manure management is going to kind of determine your license for continuing to farm in the future. That might sound a little bit drastic, but here in Wisconsin, uh, we have not taught our animals to poop any less. And so we need to figure out ways to interact between environmental concerns, animal health concerns, as well as uh, the weather that continually gets more difficult to predict. So when we talk about tools that are available, an analogy that I would like to propose is just that when you're looking to fix something, um, you want to have as many tools as possible that are available to you so that you can use the right tool for that specific job and be very specific about the, um, the tool that you can choose there. And so, if we decide that we don't want to choose a tool to help adapt to manure management, then I think we might only have one tool available, which is um, maybe not specifically the right one for the job. And so if we think that it, we can just continue, or if, if we think that it's really not time to make a lot of adaptations when it comes to manure, I think that we may go down the road of having less and less tools available to us. So. The information that I provide, we hope to be uh, one of the tools that are available for farmers. So this is um, a couple of statements that I presented to our Water Quality Task Force in Wisconsin, which is a group of policymakers tasked with understanding more about water quality and water quality challenges in our state. And to summarize, it's just that what we're trying to do is to help every farm 
improve and continuously improve, but really that improvement is a very subtle balance of practices that protect both surface water and groundwater. Discovery Farms doesn't do groundwater work. We have done agricultural tile drainage work, we've done surface water work, and we've done uh, monitoring within stream. But the practices, all of the practices need to be um, thoroughly adapted so that they're really striking that balance of surface water and groundwater. So our first bit of data here is about um, our average monthly surface runoff. And so first at the bottom of the screen, I'll just direct your attention to the fact that there's two state outlines there. Um, the unique situation that we have is to be able to combine Wisconsin and Minnesota data because we work with pretty similar climate conditions and a lot of similar farming systems. So we've been able to combine our data sets. So this uh, is surface water runoff data that's from Wisconsin and Minnesota. And on my slides, if you're ever wondering if it's Wisconsin and Minnesota or just Wisconsin, you can look at the bottom and I uh, tried to put that there as a key for you. So when we're talking about average monthly surface runoff, being able to visualize what um, these numbers mean in terms of like one inch of surface runoff is sort of like visualizing an inch of precipitation in a rain gauge and then just spreading that out across an entire basin um, or an entire field or whatever unit you want to think about. So when we're talking about our average monthly surface runoff, um, those that inch number is um, spread across the whole, is accounted for across the whole field. So what you can find when you're looking at this data is really that uh, first of all, you can see that March is a different colored bar there, just to draw your attention to the fact that it's really far and away the month where we see the most surface water runoff in Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, that for us usually means some combination of rain on either frozen or non-frozen but still saturated soils, a melting of snow, um, a rain on snow, which ends up with rain and melted snow together. So it's some, March becomes kind of a tension zone for us where the soil is starting to thaw, the snow, uh, if there's snow there, it's melting. Um, sometimes we'll get additional snowfalls during that month and then the temperature will increase. So there's really kind of, that's kind of our tension zone between um, winter and spring. And so we have traditionally seen the most runoff during that month and the most consistent runoff. Uh, I think we're still hovering near 100% in terms of the probability that our sites will see runoff sometime in March. So pretty much every site we've monitored um, has seen runoff in March. So what's interesting though is that um, from knowing what this graph has looked like over the past few years, we are starting to see the a less of a disparity between the months of February really through June. Um, and so we kind of end up, if you're talking about critical runoff periods, we are really having to help farmers understand how to gauge critical conditions when you're talking about mineral application or other field operations during that entire time span. Because even though March is the riskiest, it there is a good potential for runoff um, all the way between February and June because of those frozen soils and then saturated soils and just the way that we've been receiving precipitation. Overall, when you think about the amount of precipitation on average that we see as runoff, it's not a very high percentage of our um, annual precipitation. About 3.1 inches per year ends up as runoff. So that's uh, I think that hovers right between like eight and 10% of our annual precipitation here. So really uh, what I wanted to center my talk on today was kind of try to get at the four R's of manure management and water quality. Um, obviously product is manure, which can be different, definitely different from farm to farm. But one of the first things I'll focus on here is timing. And so the interaction between manure and critical runoff periods becomes pretty obvious in some of our data sets here. This is um, just my first example here of when we're working with um, our data, one of the things that we can do is to plot 
related factors against each other. And so on this graph, what I have is each dot represents one event from Bragger Family Dairy, which I mentioned was the first farm. His monitoring on his farm was actually stream monitoring. So these are events within stream. And so each dot represents an event. And then we've got total phosphorus concentration in that event on the y axis and then soil concentration on the x axis. This is only for events that happened when the soil was not frozen. But what you can see is that the um, total phosphorus concentration and the soil concentration really end up following a linear trend, but there was a couple of events that don't follow that trend. And those were um, two events that happened in October of 2005. And so what happened in this situation was that um, crops had come off. Joe uses a um, um, custom manure hauler to haul his manure. And they sort of gave him the question that many farmers have had of, I can either come this week or I won't be there for three weeks. And so as Joe tells it, uh, the way that this scenario played out was that his wife told him, don't do it looks like it's going to rain tomorrow, um, you know, the weather doesn't look good, don't do it. And so he did it anyways. And what we can see is that what drives this is the dissolved phosphorus losses, which show that there was impact from the manure application to the, that runoff, just because that manure was applied so shortly before runoff occurred. And so in the grand scheme of things, um, these two events really didn't, you know, they didn't result in a fish kill, didn't result in a um, overall large load to the stream or anything like that. But we can see how um, manure decisions impact that water quality, if, if, especially when we see manure applied shortly before a runoff event. So one of the things, and as if you remember my runoff graph from, before, October is not a time period which, which we would call a critical runoff time period. And so what it just shows is that there's, um, there is a chance of runoff throughout the whole year, but how do we arm ourselves with the tools to be able to predict, predict that better? So one of the tools in Wisconsin that, um, that farmers use is the runoff risk advisory forecast. This was developed through a partnership of a whole bunch of people, including the National Weather Service and our Department of Ag and um, the University of Wisconsin. This, some of our data was used to calibrate this model. And so what it does is just allow, it provides a space for farmers to go and check out um, what the relative runoff risk might be over the next few days. So this was today's forecast. The pink I'm sure shows up because our, um, Soil is getting frozen at the top and we had some snow yesterday. And so there's a chance that it will start to melt and with added water on top of it, there is there is a chance for runoff. So a lot of the questions that we get end up being about this winter manure application question and frozen soils. In Wisconsin, um, farms that are not confined animal feeding operations can spread manure through the winter season, um, except for in small in parts of the state that have uh, special ordinances because of the soil types and uh, depth to bedrock. But what we can see on this graph is that really um, for Wisconsin, late winter and early winter are sort of two different things. They're, they're definitely different in terms of risk. You saw that on the runoff graph when um, January and February have a lower amount of runoff that occurs than in March, and there's a lower probability of runoff as well at those time periods. And so when working with farmers, um, if farmers don't have the option to have enough storage to get them through the winter, one of the things that we talk with them about is making sure that you're trying, doing all that you can do to avoid late winter which would be kind of that like February, March time period. And also um, if you have to spread during that period, finding fields that are of the least risk um, to surface water and groundwater. So um, what you can see from this graph is that we plotted on the y-axis dissolved phosphorus loss, and this is in pounds per acre compared to total phosphorus loss and also in pounds per acre. This falls linearly on um, sort of a one-to-one -one line because in the winter, we rarely really see 
very much particulate phosphorus loss. So total phosphorus loss is really driven by dissolved, dissolved phosphorus. What's on this graph, each dot represents the, um, to the phosphorus loss during the frozen soil period on one of our sites. So each dot is a frozen time period site year. And so what you can see is that the square, the circles that are filled in are sites that no winter manure was applied during that site year. There are open squares where manure was applied during the early winter time period. So what we defined as November through January, and then the open circles were in the late winter time period, February through March. And what we can see is that really the, um, open circles out towards the tail of the data are really indicative that that late winter manure application is, is a risky time period and can increase phosphorus loss in snowmelt by two to four times compared to either no winter manure application or early winter application. What's interesting too is that the filled in circles are um, no winter manure application in that year. And so what drives having dissolved phosphorus losses to be higher during that frozen ground period. That's something that we'll explore next. And as far as early winter manure application, early winter and no winter manure application were fairly similar in terms of um, the amount of total phosphorus loss during that time period. So really timing does play a very critical role in trying to kind of cut the top off of our phosphorus losses during the frozen ground period. So one of the analyses that we did was to try to understand um, taking our dissolved phosphorus flow-weighted mean concentrations and you know, sort of plotting them by their range and the median of events to understand kind of the relative risk between different management practices. And so on here we have, this is the same frozen soil data that is used to make these plots. And what you can see is that for late winter manure application, there's quite a wide range there of um, concentrations that result from fields that have a, had a late winter manure application. And then we can, we've done some statistics to show that um, that really kind of is in a class of its own in that late winter manure application. But that interestingly, we've done some soil testing that's incremental to try to just get at what kind of um, phosphorus stratification exists in our systems. And so early winter application statistically is similar to having soil test phosphorus of greater than 75 parts per million in the top inch of soil. So as we think about moving forward with farming systems and practices, really considering um, how we're building up phosphorus on the soil is very important as we move forward. The range isn't as great there between um, early winter application and that soil test phosphorus being above 75, but the um, statistics show that it can react similarly. And then the group, the other group that's alone by itself is just really the less than 75 parts per million soil test phosphorus in the top inch or the top six inches for fields that are tilled. So when we're thinking about soil test phosphorus and how that might impact water quality, a number that um, seems to be starting to hold true for us is the 75 parts per million in the top inch if you are a no-till farm and in the top six inches for farms that use tillage to do more soil mixing. So when we go back to this graph, some of the reasons why that um, no winter mineral application sites saw high phosphorus losses during that winter time period is because those are some of the sites that have that um, stratification of phosphorus at the surface, long-term no-till sites with surface supplied manure. So what are some of the ways to be able to try and um, address this issue of timing with manure? Well, really trying to apply nutrients close to when the crop needs them and not close to when a runoff event is likely which I always tell people in Wisconsin that gives you like about 15 minutes per year to get your manure on. And that's not a situation that we can live with in here. So trying to figure out new ways to put manure on and figure out parts of your farming system that you can 
um, specifically work in different types of um, windows for manure application is really what we're going to need to do going forward. So side dressing manure, that's something that I know other states have tried in Wisconsin, they're trying trying to do some of that um, manure irrigation, whether we can take a cover crop for a small grain for a small grain or figure out other windows to spread manure closer to when a crop could utilize the nutrients that are in it so that we don't have manure um, application all during one time of year when the crop's not ready to use it. So that was timing and then timing really does interplay with placement as well. I mean, I've already talked a little bit about no-till fields and um, surface applied manure. So, you know, is the answer then in totally incorporation. So the work that I'm going to talk about now is from a project that was done in Western Wisconsin in two different watersheds one of which was a strongly dairy watershed and the other was mostly grain. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about the dairy watershed and um, some of the results from different manure placements that we saw there. And all of these resources are available on our website for you to take a look at as well. So this, this, in this project, we had um, five field sites that we monitored. Uh, there was a pasture site, there was um, a couple of no-till sites, and um, one site that incorporated manure and then used tillage, another, one, another passive tillage to prepare for planting. So in this scenario here, we have um, the pasture site was JF2, the no-till site was JF4, and then that crop rotation was alfalfa and corn. Um, for grain and for silage, ultimately. And then um, JF5 was the site that incorporated manure, incorporated liquid manure, and then um, also used tillage uh, another time to prepare planting for like alfalfa and for corn. So um, what you can see from this graph, I've got dissolved phosphorus. This is annual dissolved phosphorus pounds per acre for each of these sites for each of the years that we we were studying there. So you can see that it ranges really from zero to two pounds for this dissolved phosphorus fraction. And if you look closely at the pasture and um, no-till sites, which is JF2 and JF4, they perform pretty similarly in terms of dissolved losses in most of the years. You can also see there that that, that farm that uses um, incorporated manure instead of surface applied does have lower dissolved phosphorus losses um, throughout the study period and um, what when that really comes into play is when we see dissolved phosphorus losses in winter because on these other two sites we that's when we mostly see dissolved phosphorus moving so that incorporation really did decrease annual dissolved p loss and um, when it, especially when it was compared to surface applied manure in no-till fields and pasture. But there's always a but, right? And so um, this, is, this is a big one. So on this graph, what, what I have is total phosphorus loss. So this includes dissolved and particulate losses. And what you can see is that um, even though that JF5 performed very well in terms of um, dissolved phosphorus losses, we have had we had a couple of years of very high soil losses from that field, like about from three to five thousand pounds per acre loss in two of the years of the study. That really um, shows the impact that even though incorporation does do a very good job of addressing dissolved phosphorus concerns, and people always ask about um, spreading manure on the surface. In this case, incorporation was done in a way that resulted in so much soil loss that it really negated the effects of um, incorporating that manure for dissolved phosphorus benefit. So what we saw um, when we look at total P is that it actually increased annual sediment and total P loss compared to surface applied manure in no-till fields and pasture. So then the question is kind of like, well, how, what's the what's the right answer here is it surface applied manure or is it incorporated and i guess to me the answer can be both you know the watershed where that work came from is um got a lot of highly erodible land and that tillage was too extreme for the landscape there 
And so as we're seeing these tools that are becoming available that do incorporate manure, but without soil disturbance that would lead to high losses, those are the tools that we really need to focus on as we move into the future with manure. So um, for us, what we're talking to farmers about is trying to find ways if you have liquid manure and if um, if you have liquid manure to be able to incorporate that in such a way that doesn't create a lot of soil loss and also into a living cover is one of probably the best ways to try to ensure against nutrient loss in this manure application setting. Because not only does that living cover kind of help heal in where the manure was incorporated, but it also um, is there and available to take up some of those nutrients before you're ready for planting that field again. So to me, it's really a very important subtle balance to strike to be able to, um, if you're going to, if you think that applying on the surface is gonna lead to higher losses, then it has to be incorporated in a way that doesn't just um, turn the teeter-totter the other direction. So one of the things that we've started to talk to farmers about in Wisconsin is nitrogen use efficiency. And um, for me, if you're following along about my concept of the four R's and manure management in this talk, the this is my way of sort of talking about rate. Um, for us, when we are working with farmers on rate and nitrogen use efficiency with manure, um, most of the nitrogen use efficiency work has been done further south than Wisconsin is and in fields that don't use manure as a major source of nutrients and um, in uh, predominantly corn grain systems. Wisconsin's one of the largest, if not the largest producer of corn silage in the United States. And so we need to be able to understand more about nitrogen use efficiency in more than just corn grain. And we also need to understand more about the use of organic nutrients like manure, as well as um, legume credits from alfalfa to help our farmers really get at this question of nitrogen and nutrient loss in our systems. So we started the nitrogen use efficiency project in Wisconsin in 2015 as a result of a conservation innovation grant. We've continued that work beyond the life of the grant and now we've been, we've worked with 85 farmers and been on over 300 fields in 15 counties in Wisconsin to really try to help um, benchmark nitrogen use efficiency in Wisconsin, as well as train farmers and farm advisors in the tools that they need to be able to assess it in the farms that they operate or the farms that they assist with. So some of our data from that, when we start to spread out, start to split out um, the data set between corn silage and corn grain, we do start to see some interesting things. So I'm gonna mostly talk about corn silage and manure um, from our nitrogen use efficiency results here. So what I can see, what we can see is that um, when we look at the amount of N supplied there for systems that have manure compared to systems that don't have manure, um, we're seeing a higher N supplied number for systems that are using manure compared to those that are not. And um, in producing corn silage, inherently one of the things that you're probably gonna have is manure because you're producing a forage and um, need to do something with the recycled cow feed after it's done. And so the, um, the manure and corn silage interplay is really important for Wisconsin. But what I can see here is that we're still using book values in a lot of cases for nutrient crediting in manure. And um, there's kind of a lack of faith in the amount of nutrients that are available in manure and when they'll be available. And so it kind of leads to a higher nitrogen supplied number um, when we're utilizing manure as one of the main nutrient sources here. So. It's interesting how um, approaches to manure management have focused in the last few years upon when you can spread and where you can spread. And we, I think, need to make an increased focus on helping farmers to really understand their manure system because the manure systems have really changed over the past um, several years. And so 
using book values to represent those systems is really no longer um, giving us the highest utility there. Um, if you're wondering about the types of manure that are in our data set here, we have 139 fields that are using manure. 69% of those fields are dairy and 13% are beef and 16% are poultry. On this graph, what you can see is a couple of things. So um, what I have on the y-axis is the yield for corn silage and tons per acre, and then N supplied on the x-axis in pounds per acre. And the different coloring of the dots just shows how much manure nitrogen was used um, to for their total unsupplied number. So as the dots get darker, there's a higher amount of N supplied as manure compared to either fertilizer or um, legume sources. So if you look at those fields that are um, above 200 or above 250, you can see that a higher proportion of the manure supply or a higher proportion of the N supplied is from manure. And um, in many cases, there was high amounts of manure nutrients, manure N supplied and um, a high amount of N supplied total. But then also you can see some of those dots are not as dark in the above 200 or above 250. And those are often the farms that are also trying to balance alfalfa credits in with both fertilizer and manure. And one thing we have really seen in our data set is that as we um, have farms that are using more than one nitrogen source, balancing those sources, but between trying to get uh, the yield that they need and the yield that's profitable, balancing those sources of organic legume and fertilizer sources becomes a real challenge and, and supplied often really creeps up in those situations. So the result of that when we talk about nitrogen use efficiency To non manure, there's a higher proportion of fields that are below average nitrogen use efficiency compared to um, corn that didn't use manure as one of the nutrient sources. And um, so, this is kind of a trend that we've been seeing is that with manured fields, we're just having a bigger challenge of meeting our nitrogen use efficiency goals. And um, a lot of that has to do with our. Um, farmers sort of having questions about how much nitrogen is in manure, will it still be there when I need it? Um, how do we really account for the nutrients that are in there? And how do we better account for the nutrients now that our manure systems look so different compared to how they did um, 15, even 15 years ago? So in this data set, we have dairy, beef, and poultry. So there's a lot of um, variety, there's some variety there. But if we're thinking specifically about dairy systems and how uh, most of the manure comes from, a lot of the manure comes from pits and is liquid manure now, how do we account for changes within the pit and um, different changes in that manure content or availability for fields when they're at different uh, levels being pumped? And how do we um, try to increase the availability in the fields for when the crop is gonna need it. So these are big questions that we're trying to, um, if book values are no longer the answer, then we need to help farmers get as specific as possible for their operations to be able to address this. And so nitrogen use efficiency might be one of the tools that farmers could use to um, be able to keep an eye on how this is working for them and be able to try to make changes and monitor them on their own farm. So in talking about water quality, we can talk about phosphorus, we can talk about nitrogen, and we really haven't talked much about soil or soil loss. And I think that's kind of one of the foundations of water quality and farm productivity. And so I just wanted to take a minute to um, not just talk about manure, but also to talk about what our data says about soil and soil losses. 
really the main message for you is going to be that um, doing all of these things, there are so many things to consider for water quality and management of nutrients and soil on a farm, but controlling soil losses is, is really the first step to doing any kind of um, continuous improvement when it comes to water quality. So um, what we have here is Wisconsin and Minnesota data that shows the annual soil losses on the y-axis and then we've split our data into fields that have been um, that have used tillage so that's more than one pass of tillage per season as well as fields that use no-till which we call one or less and a lot of times that one pass is like a turbo till sort of situation. What you can see is that um, what really sticks out at first is just the range about that um, in the tilled fields, the, the range of what we can see for annual soil losses goes, has gone all the way up to almost 8,000 pounds per acre. That's a lot of soil moving uh, within a field. Um, and this is different from like a T value or a Russell 2 number where you get a modeled number of uh, the amount of soil movement in a field. So you might see um, like numbers like two tons per acre of movement within the field. That's what Russell 2 is accounting for. This is actually soil that has come to the monitoring station and left the field. So that's a lot of soil movement within the field. That's um, And that range for tilled fields is really large. And what happens is um, the fields that uh, have more tillage sort of become in different times of the year more vulnerable to soil losses if you get one of those weather events or if you get um, saturated soil and rain back to back to back which be is becoming more and more common. In the no-tilled fields you can see that the median is really low as well as the range is very low. I don't think we've had a no-till field that lost more than a thousand pounds of soil per acre um, yet in our data set and the ones that are close to that were ones that were starting to have erosion alongside of a waterway or things like that. So um, what no-till really seems to do for soil loss is to kind of cut off the top of that range and be able to um, provide you some stability when it comes to soil loss for a variety of different weather events. It doesn't really solve phosphorus necessarily. So um, what we can see is we're splitting out total phosphorus and dissolved phosphorus again. And in that middle graph, which is total phosphorus loss, what you can see is that there's no longer this big disparity between tillage and no-till fields. Um, it really has become much more similar to each other. And actually the no-till median is just slightly larger than um, the median for those tilled fields. And the driver for that really, the driver for um, phosphorus loss in the tilled fields is really soil loss. And then the driver in no-tilled fields is really the dissolved phosphorus losses. So all those things we talked about before, which were timing of manure applications or fertilizer applications and the placement um, and whether the phosphorus is really stratified in those soils, things like that become um, a real, a much bigger player in phosphorus losses, especially in those no-till systems. So what you can see on that far right graph then is that dissolved phosphorus loss annually for no-till farms is higher than tillage farms. And what that does is ends up kind of equating the total phosphorus loss from tillage and no-till systems. So again, the message here is that um, it's not just a uh, simple system change that's going to be the thing that um, that makes uh, such a huge impact for water quality. It's all of the pieces of the system plus the management of that system that really ends up creating that balance we want to strike. So as I get towards the end of what I've um, got to share with you, one of the things that uh, I talk about a lot in Wisconsin is really trying to figure out what dials to turn. And so there are sometimes changes that can have a big impact, sometimes changes can have a more subtle impact. So this it looks kind of like the radio that I grew up with in the barn um, that I always wanted to change to a different station than my parents wanted it tuned to. But the, the biggest dials to really be concerned about on the face of this radio is the tuning and the volume. 
And so for us, as we're talking to farmers about things, that's really soil loss and timing. Those are the two big dials to be um, really watching. And if you don't have those dials really closely dialed in, then some of these other questions about placement or um, additives or anything that seems a little bit more subtle, you're really not going to see a big change in your overall system unless you have um, those big dials already where they need to be. So in this radio example, if your volume's way off and your tuning is way off, then don't mess around with the balance based in treble. So to wrap up, I would say the key lessons from this part of Discovery Farms um, information is just that uh, I didn't talk a whole lot about the amount of runoff and how that's influenced by soil char characteristics. We do see some differences um, between the silt loam soils on the west side of the state and the clay soils on the right side or on the east side of the state. But um, and also for us, frozen the frozen ground period really determines a lot about runoff and. So some of the things that influence runoff are under the control of the farmer and some really aren't. For us, it is not realistic to think that um, we would ever have zero runoff in Wisconsin because uh, that frozen ground period is something that's really pretty difficult to control. In the non-frozen ground period, um, some of the practices that are often talked about of like no-till and um, covers and soil health and those things do have an impact on the amount of runoff that happens during the non-frozen ground time period. But equally important um, is the timing of manure and fertilizer application. And so that would be one of those big dials that I mentioned. And then placement of nutrients also really needs attention as we go forward, um, especially with manure, um, manure and manure application. Nitrogen use and corn production are kind of unique in Wisconsin. And so we need to make, what we're trying to work at is creating a larger farmer driven database to help us with our solutions for that and to help farmers be able to document their progress. And then lastly, but not least, controlling soil losses is, is really that first step in managing phosphorus loss. And so that's the other big dial to um, really be watching when it comes to um, looking at ways to continuously improve on the farm. So that's the end of what I've got. If there, I think there, we might have time for questions, Julia. Yep, so we're gonna get started with the Q&A then. Um, we're going to give attendees one minute to submit your questions into the question box. Um, we'll be back on then to answer those questions in one minute. Okay, Amber, so the first question we have is, did you see much difference in soil loss or nutrient loss with different types of cover crops? 
Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, we are really still working to um, increase our database on cover crops. We have one before and after study in place right now with our first two years of cover crop data. Um, we just finished collecting. So that will be coming up in Wisconsin. Um, uh, what we've seen from cover crops is that um, a lot of our soil losses happen in that like April, May, June time period. And so for us, cover crops that um, die over winter are not gonna be there to do any soil protecting during that time period. So we've encouraged cover crops that can live through the winter here, which really narrows the list. But um, I mean, rye is obviously one of them. We're starting to see some other things um, that have some good success on making it through the winter. But really um, soil cover and lack of soil disturbance is what we see as um, kind of the main drivers of soil loss. So um, in those farms that used a couple of passages, passes of tillage and they're in highly erodible landscapes, that's where we can see those ranges of soil loss really increasing. So the farms that are already using residue cover and um, keeping the soil undisturbed those are the farms that we aren't seeing much for soil losses. So I wouldn't suspect there'd be much change in using a cover crop, but there might be other benefits to using a cover crop in those systems. Okay, the next question is, was there any differences in losses dependent upon depth of knife applications? That's another good question. Our studies aren't really set up to, um, we aren't able to have kind of enough variation in our um, sample sizes to be able to get that specific. Um, so what we've seen mostly is the difference in the amount of um, soil disturbance that uh, that an injected or incorporated application would do. So since we're not mo also since we're not monitoring groundwater, um, the depth of application part, we wouldn't be able to really quantify losses that uh, might not be at the surface, but are deeper. Okay, next question is, was soil compaction measured in the winter spreading study? No, that's a good question too. So um, in our winter spreading numbers, those are um, just a variety of different fields that um, have that had used and had not used winter spreading. Um, and so the, yes, we did not measure compaction in them. The ones that were no-till fields um, showed during the non-frozen ground period, really high rates of infiltration. And so um, I would say that there's not tons of compaction pres present for at least the no-till fields because we saw less runoff during the non-frozen ground period in those same fields. All right, next question is, do you know of any manure irrigation systems suitable for smaller fields and with in-crop capabilities? There is a big need for these systems. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't, I can't tell you any um, like brands or company names. Um, I, that's something that um, we could reach out to kind of to our networks to find out more about. There is a big need in Wisconsin we had for a while um, some consternation about whether manure should be irrigated or not. And we had, um, there was a large study done about the impacts of airborne pathogens and things like that from irrigated manure. And what basically that study found that it really is a viable practice and had, doesn't have impacts on human health. Um, and so that was kind of the first step in us being able to utilize it more in Wisconsin. Uh, I really see it as a very viable practice, especially as we're starting to see more of these um, dewatering systems for manure. How do we how do we use irrigation to our advantage to um, decrease our time on the roads, to decrease our costs with having to haul um, watery manure farther, things like that. So we we're hoping that by um, using what we know about manure and water quality that we can help to drive the demand and ultimately the supply of systems like that. 
Next question is, can you elaborate further on injection, the effects on yields and reductions in commercial fertilizer requirements? So um, in terms of the injection reduction in yields, um, we don't have any um, specific work from our studies that uh, really get at that. I think the bigger question um, with the bigger question for us with incorporation of manure is the availability, which is um, the second part of that question. And I think for that, we are going to need to be able to help our farmers do their own on farm trials to be able to quantify what is available from the manure that they're injecting, and then also um, when it becomes available so that we can adjust our recommendations based on that. So what we've seen in some cases, what we've started to see, at least in some cases for the farmers that we've been working with, is that um, when you put on a cover, there is still some question about when that, even after the cover is killed, when that um, nutrient becomes available again. And so the same is true with manure. When, is, when it's applied, uh, can you really still count that it will all be there? How does compaction play into that? Um, just the the dynamics of where manure was in the pit and the nutrient content differences there. So it's almost like a dynamic, constantly changing thing. And so we have to be able to at least do better than book values to be able to put some sidebars on for farmers. And I think one of the things that that's going to really require is them having long term records to be able to find the trends in what they see with their data. All right, next question is, would stratified soil testing for P be a good indicator of how well phosphorus is managed in a given field? So stratified phosphorus, um, testing for stratified phosphorus is something that we've started to tell people that for long-term no-till situations especially would be a good, um, would be a good thing to start to add. It's a good indicator um, for being able to kind of give some expectations about what the surface runoff water quality might look like on that field. You may, it may or may not have impacts agronomically um, on crop yield or things like that. Whether it's a good indicator of how phosphorus is managed, um, I think there's certainly ranges that would show you um, the kind of the long term management there, but uh, in terms of being able to. Uh, show that you know your nutrient management planning is consistent with the amount of crop uptake that there might be things like that. We didn't have any um, stratified values that were like way off of the charts and so for us that indicates that farmers are utilizing nutrient management and um, trying to balance phosphorus with crop needs but it is a good indicator um, and it, become, it becomes stronger and stronger, especially with longer term no-till systems of uh, when you might be at more risk for dissolved phosphorus losses when you've already managed, managed to basically eliminate particulate phosphorus. So that's where good questions come in about would a cover crop help cycle that um, by using the, um, can we use the roots to move that phosphorus down in the system? Is that where we really do need to figure out if um, incorporation is the long-term solution there. So that kind of leads us to more questions. Next question is, are lower NUE values in corn silage a result of excess N supplied from an underestimation of nitrogen supplied from organic sources or extra fertilizer added because organic sources weren't considered reliable? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so the, you know, NUE becomes like just the first step indicator of what we need to look further into. And so then we work with farmers to do a zero nitrogen strip that's compared to a strip that where they have um, their kind of current management on those fields. And corn silage NUE is more difficult to interpret than um, corn grain NUE just because we're removing the whole plant as well. So one of the things that's um, important to really think about is that, yes, like some of those low NUE values could come from 
the fact that um, they're not crediting appropriately. So if even if they are taking credits and book values, there might be um, more or less there than what they took credit for. Managing both the legume sources and the organic sources, both of which um, sometimes can make you feel a little like you're not sure what's really there. And then following that up with fertilizer, we've seen, we've definitely seen situations where um, a fertilizer application was added sort of as insurance there. There's also a question of how much, what's the balance? So we've certainly had zero end strips and that showed that um, even though it seemed like there was enough manure there that an added fertilizer really did manage to uh, make a yield benefit that was significant. And so what is the balance? Could we, can we really fertilize the entire crop with manure or is there some kind of, is it 50-50 manure and fertilizer? Is it some other number? And so how do we help farmers um, really account for those, those different questions? So in some scenarios, we've helped farmers to validate that um, legume credits from alfalfa really are there. In some scenarios, we've helped um, farmers to uh, be able to reduce fertilizer applications because of that. In some situations, we have seen that there was not as much nitrogen in the manure as we thought. And then the last part of that is that with fields of, with a history of manure application, how does that play into nitrogen availability in the soil? Like um, second year credits, third year credits, even more than that. Uh, and how do we balance that with nitrogen uptake that we see? Okay, next question is, how would a farmer trying to no-till be able to mitigate their P losses? That's a good question. So for a farmer that's trying no-till, the first thing that they're doing to mitigate P loss is controlling soil loss. And that's the first biggest thing. Uh, after that, um, if it's a farmer with manure, I think considering, you know, making sure that timing of manure application is as far away from a runoff event as possible, as well as close to when the crop is going to need it. So, um, and even just like trying to get a manure application closely timed when, when there's soil cover on the surface so that we can try and protect those nutrients there. Um, so if it's a farmer with manure, considering the, um, those low disturbance incorporation methods, though I know that it's pretty difficult. One of our farmers um, talked about how we want him to no-till during the season. We want him to incorporate manure. And then we want to, um, you know, magically sprinkle on a cover crop. And so there's, you know, sort of competing interests there, right? And it's definitely a balance to keep. For farmers with no-till, the first biggest step is eliminating soil loss. Then after that is really watching timing of application. And then trying to figure out if there are strategies to reduce stratification in those fields, whether it is incorporation of manure um, through a low disturbance mechanism, whether we can use crops and cover crops to do that. Um, those are kind of like the priority steps that I would say. All right, and the last question we're gonna do, and this one's a little longer, is you talk about total and dissolved phosphorus. Is there any test or method that will identify for a particular soil what the maximum phosphorus holding capacity is? My assumption would be that the closer we get to this capacity, the higher the dissolved phosphorus level would be. I would also assume soils are different, so how do we know how to adjust best management practices to those differences? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so off the top of my head, I can't tell you the exact name or lab to call to get a test, but um, from like the soil, from soil science in general, those soils that have a higher organic matter um, are going to have more binding sites for phosphorus. And, um, you know, that number that we sort of are centering on, which is more than 75 parts per million in the top inch is definitely an average across our data, data set. Um, as we get more different types of soil, I think there will be um, opportunity to try to refine that a little better and get more specific about soils. And really the main message um, 
for us is not necessarily that there's one specific number that you need to look out for or anything like that. It's really about understanding the different balances that need to be struck within each system. So in a no-till system, there are different things to think about than in a tillage system. And if you're somewhere on the continuum of those things, there's going to be benefits and challenges with each. And so what we're trying to do is to just be able to have information that um, can kind of apply in any situation and then allow farmers and farmer advisors to work together to kind of make that more specific. So as we think about soil types, um, that's something that you're not really going to change. And um, in sandy soils, the surface runoff isn't going to be the biggest concern there. And in um, clay soils, it's mostly going to be surface runoff. And so how do we balance the way that our um, water moves across farming landscapes and the way that it interacts with soil? How do we get it to infiltrate during um, all times of the year and how do we get it to be available there for the crop and not um, lost into waterways so the soil is definitely the foundation of it but um, soil testing and um, getting to a specific number is probably not achievable towards um, being able to kind of predict losses but being able to sort of have like a general risk indicator is kind of our hope. All right. Thank you for everyone sending in questions. In the interest of time, I'd like to wrap up the Q&A. I want to thank you again, Amber, for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your work with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was a great opportunity. And um, my email and contact information is part of the presentation. So absolutely um, get in touch if you have more questions. All right. Help us keep these webinars free by making a tax deductible donation to PARM. By giving just $50 today, you can support this webinar series that provides the egg community with the latest research on nutrient management from experts across the United States, as well as continuing education units to crop advisors. Go to partnershipfarm.org slash donate to contribute today. We will also send a donation link in our follow-up email along with the webinar recording and evaluation. At this time, I want to recognize our premier egg retailer members, the Andersons, a gold member, and silver members, Gerti Egg and Nutrient Egg Solutions. Their contributions help to make this webinar possible and help promote the strides that egg retailers are making to reduce nutrient impairments. For more information on membership and all the benefits that come with it, contact our project manager at caitlin at partnershipfarm.org or visit our website and click become a member to fill out our online form. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge additional funders and collaborators that made this webinar possible. In particular, the McKnight Foundation, the Great Lakes Protection Fund, and Purdue University's Center for Food and Agricultural Business. If you are interested in sponsoring future webinars, please contact me at julia at partnershipfarm.org or visit our website. As we wrap up, please remember to look for the follow-up email in a few days with the webinar evaluation and webinar recording. If you submitted your CCA number at registration and are viewing this webinar live or the recording within two weeks of the original date, your CEUs will be automatically submitted. Only if you watch the recording more than two weeks after the original broadcast date do you need to email me at julia at partnershipfarm.org your CCA number to ensure your CEUs are submitted. One last reminder to please take the webinar evaluation. The link to the survey is provided on this slide and will also be emailed to all registrants in a few days. The survey is a great way to let us know what topics you want to hear about on future webinars. I want to thank you all again for joining us today and hope you join us again for our next webinar in December.